Uh, our fourth and final speaker in the morning panel is Jeff Wasserstrom, professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. He earned his doctorate uh, here at UC Berkeley, uh, as well as a master's from Harvard University and a bachelor's from the University of California at Santa Cruz. His research and teaching focus on China's recent past with interests in global history and comparative gender history. He is the editor or co-editor of numerous books, including Human Rights and Rev Revolutions. And he is also the author of many books, including Student Protests in 20th Century China, The View from Shanghai, China's Brave New World and Other Tales for Global Times, and most recently, Global Shanghai, 1850 to 2010. And uh, next month, is that right? Next month, uh, he will have another book out, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. His presentation today is entitled, The Bund Between the Wars, Tales of a New Icon and an Old Struggle. Professor Wasserstrom, thank you. It's always a pleasure to come back um, to Berkeley um, for intellectual reasons, for the food, for the view, um, for, um, in this case, also, also the art. Um, there's a lot of talk in the academy, there has been for the last 20 years, about interdisciplinarity. That's been the mantra that we need to cross disciplines. But what's exciting to me, and I think really was inspirational about the way this was put together, is that there are other kinds of crossovers between um, things, not just between disciplines, that I think are increasingly important crossing between the academy and the community, which this event clearly does, and also crossing between the world of universities and the world of um, museums. So it's, it's really a treat for me to be here. Um, I also get to plug a book or two. Um, this one, um, I, I, you know, I, put, I wanted the image to begin with this to um, draw attention to it because um, it's a very strange book because it ends in the future, which historians aren't supposed to do. It was published a year ago. Um, now I'm wishing, though, that it hadn't quite come out yet because I would have changed, added to um, little things in each chapter based on each of the papers I've heard so far. I've been learning a lot about areas that I, um, I didn't know enough about. But what I'll do today in, um, in building on some of the things that have already been said is I want to talk about um, a particular part of Shanghai, a particular part of the Bund, um, which is represented in this, uh, the two buildings at the center here, which are, um, you've already seen at um, some point already, but this is the domed um, Hong Kong and Shanghai bank building, and next to it is the custom house with a clock that was uh, shipped over from um, England, it was built specially there, it was the largest clock in um, Asia when it was uh, sent over. It was one of the largest clocks in the world. It was supposed to, we've heard in the first paper about legibility. Uh, these buildings were in part to make uh, the British, uh, British and American run part of the city legible to uh, international travelers and expats. And so to make it legible by looking like uh, a British uh, locale. So that big clock was nicknamed Big Ching, like, <laughs> like Big Ben only in Asia. And it's very interesting. I, um, the particular Britishness of it is sometimes lost. Um, we think of this, I think of, it, it, you'll often hear Shanghai talked about as a place where East meets West. And the idea is somehow simply that there was an East, meaning China, and a West, meaning Europe, that came together and blended. There's an element to that, but what I think some of the talks already have shown is there were different Wests coming in, and there were also different Easts. Baghdad was one of the East that came in. So Shanghai was actually a place where East met East and different West met West. And the particular Britishness of this is interesting to me. Um, the young dancer Margot Fontaine had just been, had, was British and she'd spent some time in America. And then she um, came to Shanghai. And as she looked at this kind of waterfront, she said, oh gee, Shanghai looks more like uh, England than America ever did. So these are the buildings that I'm going to be talking about, and I'm also going to talk about something that doesn't show up in this replica from the um, Urban Planning Museum, which is the, um, the most famous park in Shanghai, which was along the Bund, which I'll show some images of later. 
And these are considered very important symbols of, um, of Shanghai, like uh, the, the Cathay House, Peace Hotel. These were iconic structures, and the park was also an iconic uh, locale as well. These were things that defined Shanghai in the international imagination, global imagination, as well as in many ways the Chinese imagination for different reasons. Um, one thing, when they're talked about, the, as, as icons, icons tend to do, they tend to represent large um, periods of time. They tend, to, they tend to sometimes be stripped of their very specific historical historicity. So these buildings here in this re representation in the Urban Planning Museum, these represent the treaty port period, whereas the Pudong structures represent the, post, uh, the, the, the present period. What I want to do is try to break up this uh, association of those buildings with that long stretch of time, 1840s to the 1850s, and give them a sense of how time is more complicated in dealing with those, those objects. And I'm also going to try to find ways of saying that space is more complicated than dealing with those objects. Um, space is usually thought these buildings have always stood there, and they have always stood there, but their meaning has changed as uh, issues of space have changed. So I'll be dealing in differing ways with notions of time and space. First off, I'm going to deal with the notion of time. Those buildings that we just saw, the domed and the uh, clock tower one, were seen as representing the treaty port period, 1840s to uh, 1940s. In fact, though, the Bund, and this came clear from the wonderful um, museum exhibit, which you should all see. Um, well, I'll return at the end of whether you should go to the expo. Um, there are paintings there, borrowed from the Peabody Museum, that show very clearly uh, that the Bund did not always look like the postcard shot of the Bund that uh, was represented by those do the dome building. And this, this is um, what would eventually be where the clock tower was. This was the first custom house that was there. And this is a, the Bund around the um, 1870s, uh, 1880s. We know it's before 1893, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and those buildings, which are just a few stories high, one thing is they were already thought of as unusually lofty and grand structures, even though they weren't nearly as grand as they would become. This is the same area of the Bund after 1893. And the way you can tell is that the Custom House has gone from being a Chinese-style temple building to being something that actually looks more like Big Ben than Big Ching ever would. And so this has been redone. And um, this is the waterfront of, of um, the Bund. And there's probably an old um, bank building there. So this, the bank, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, was also the third version of that building that was put there. This clock tower was built up in 1893. And what's significant about that is it was when the Western community, particularly the British community, was celebrating the 50th anniversary of their presence in Shanghai. And were in part announcing, we're here for the long haul. They didn't know they would just be there for another um, 50 years or so. In fact, they looked ahead to when, when our children are here to celebrate the next jubilee of the city. They celebrated a jubilee in 1893 and put up this new building, among other things. Um, this is the inside of the domed building, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank building. And it was completed in, 18, uh, no, in 1923. And it was the first of, these, uh, of the three iconic structures that continue to define the Bund the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Building in 1923. Uh, the Custom House with, uh, with Big Ching it was completed in 1927. And then the um, Peace Hotel, I think, 1929, Cathay House, or 31, I'm forgetting. Um, but anyway, inside this amazing dome, there are a series of um, murals that, that quite spectacularly survived. Um, they were covered up during the Cultural Revolution, is at least how the story goes, so they survived. And on each of the panels, there's a representation of, via iconic structures, the cities in which the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Building had a headquarters at the time, 1923, when it, it went up. So this is London defined by um, a domed building and a towered building. Shanghai, interestingly, is defined also by a domed building and a towered building. In a site of hubris, the bank you're standing in is one of the iconic structures that defines the city. And then the clock tower there, um, which was then still next door to it as the custom house was the other one. By the way, you're not allowed to take photographs of these um, structures. So, um, and in fact, if you take a photograph of, of, uh, of the panel of the mural, you will be told by the security guard to put your camera away. 
So I want to get the whole series, but I can only take one picture at a time <laughs> and, and play dumb. But anyway, you, you did not see this. Oh, no, I'm on film. Okay. That's one of the things I wanted to say. Um, at this point, this is now the sort of classic look of that part of, of the Bund, actually the whole Bund, because now you can see there's the, um, the green dome there matching with, with this and um, this as, as key structures uh, to define the Bund. Um, this is 1927. The, one of the things that I, I, I stress in the book on a ch in a chapter on 1925, I, I talk about different pivotal years. The book goes through 25 year uh, segments looking at key events of 1850, 1875, 1900, 1925. 1925 is often described as a key moment in Shanghai's history because there was this great anti-imperialist movement, the May 30th movement, that helped to turn the Communist Party into a, uh, an important force. It's often seen as being the, the moment, these massive protests that showed that the days of the imperialists were numbered. But this building, um, this structure, which is incredibly grand and, and uh, massive, was being constructed by the British community in 1925, right after that movement. So even though in retrospect we know their days were numbered, people at the time, and we need to recapture this, didn't have any sense that they were, um, that they were, their time was running out. This is the classic postcard shot, um, uh, and that's one way, at least for me and some of the urbanists that I've worked with who work on other parts of the world, when we talk about urban icons, um, there was a special issue of urban history devoted to this, one of the definitions of an urban icon was the thing that shows up in the, in the postcard that makes you know this is where you are. So um, the Golden Gate Bridge being an icon for San Francisco, the Eiffel Tower being the classic example of, of, um, of the urban icon, which by the way was created for a World Expo and left behind. Um, so this you see um, the icons, I think, of, um, of Shanghai, and there's an added one that frames the shot which is the winged victory statue over here, which is now the one part of the, the, the Bund classic structure that you don't see when you're there, as um, Ye Wen Chin was mentioning as we, as we toured the exhibit. Uh, I won't talk about it, but Wen Chin has also written um, a very important piece about the meaning of time, of, of a clock, of clock time being one of the symbols of modern Shanghai in this kind of um, iconography that I recommend to you. All right, here's the uh, public park, and I, I can talk far too long about the public park, so I'll try to um, be very brief about it. But essentially, the public garden, which was set up, again, to try to make this, this foreign land legible to uh, the, the Westerners who were there, um, has a gazebo. It looks very much like a Victorian park in uh, London. The British domination of the area was largely reflected, not just in in the, the, the buildings, but also in the, the landscaping of the area. So this was very much on a British style uh, park. But what its meaning has tended to be for uh, Chinese in Shanghai and actually throughout the nation has been that this was a park that had, a, a, that, that had exclusionary policies that kept, um, uh, that was allegedly had a sign at the entrance saying no dogs or Chinese allowed. Allegedly, that sign stood there from the 1880s to, um, depending on accounts, the 1920s, or sometimes it seems that it was an exclusionary space all the way up until the founding of, of the People's Republic of China. In fact, it's much more complicated than that, and I won't go into all the details about how complicated it is, but a lot of the people who used the park routinely were Chinese, um, and no sign said no dogs or Chinese allowed. And uh, even though I get in a lot of trouble when I say this in Shanghai, because people are sure their uncle's cousin saw it. Um, so I think of that as an urban legend. On the other hand, Westerners said, all this talk of us having that kind of uh, racial attitude is, is, is crazy. We weren't that way. In fact, the kind of discrimination that that sign could have represented definitely did exist. So when I say that, I get in trouble with the people who say, well, my uncle's cousin was a Westerner in Shanghai, and he wasn't prejudiced. So um, it's a complicated story, but what's interesting, just in a real, in a real nutshell, this, the, this, the park was off limits to all Chinese other than servants attending foreign charges for most of the 1880s to the 1920s. Though they experimented with a pass system, there were elite Chinese who essentially argued from the 1880s on, hey, we understand why you want to keep the coolies out, 
but sophisticated people like us should be allowed in. And so there was an experiment with a pass system for elite Chinese, that didn't work. There was also um, a, a fascinating thing about this was one thing that really angered local Chinese was if you wanted to have a, a whites only or a European only park, that would be one thing, but they allowed Japanese and Koreans in and, that, and Indians. And so this was, this was also a complexity of thinking of just east-west terms. There were a lot of more complicated things going on there. Um, this is the sign, the photograph, and it's usually that blurry that's used in um, nationalistic texts published in, in Shanghai after 49 to prove that there was a sign saying no dogs or Chinese allowed. And when I first went to Shanghai in the 80s to live there, there was a big plaque at the entrance of the park saying this is where that reviled sign stood. And in the local history, when you look it up, you see this. In fact, this sign has a lot of regulations, says, uh, but it doesn't put dogs and Chinese in the same category. In fact, it says this park is for the foreign community, no Chinese other than servants can come in. So there is no visual evidence of, of, of a sign saying that. In the 1920s, late 20s, 1928, in part because a large number of white Russians who were, um, had come into the, um, into the city, uh, Jewish and otherwise, the, ch the elite Chinese said again, we're paying taxes, we're, we're respectable people, and yet anybody who can be the dregs of society from you know, a, a Russian immigrant can use the park and we can't, this is horrible. And this was finally a persuasive argument and a change was made in which, the, in a sense, the elite Chinese had said our class should trump our race or our nationality. And eventually their class was allowed to trump their nationality. The park was open to people of all nationalities on equal terms but there was a use fee charged, so it was made essentially off limits to the poor of all categories. Now I said there was no visual proof of a no dogs or Chinese allowed sign. There is no photographic evidence and nobody ever claimed to actually see it when it was still up there. It was always said that there used to be or something like that or their dubious claims. But recently I did discover this visual evidence, which would seem to contradict what I was just saying. But in fact, there, was, there were two visual evidences of no dogs or Chinese allowed sign. One was created after 1949 in Shanghai for a museum exhibit about the evils of imperialism. They couldn't find a photograph, so they painted a sign. But that's not this. This is from a different uh, source, um, a Bruce Lee movie released in the early 1970s in which Bruce Lee is kept out of the park and then goes ballistic and kicks the, the sign in half. And when this showed in Hong Kong, 1970s, apparently the crowds went crazy because they could relate completely to the attitude of being treated as second class citizens in their own um, locale, which is what, yeah. And you can see it on YouTube. What I want to end by doing is just talking about the way in which the meaning of the, 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 the structures, they've been consistent through time since the 1920s when they took their meaning, but their, but their significance has shifted, and I think this has a lot to do with another shift in time, which is um, that these are two versions of uh, the same guidebook, which, uses a, which use a similar kind of motif, but I think there's a radical change that then leads to another change in what the Bund here is, is symbolizing. Here I think what you see is the Bund is representing the West along with the image of um, classical music, and this is representing the East. And so the idea is th that Shanghai, the kick of Shanghai at this point was still seen, as it was seen for a long time, as a place where you had elements of the West juxtaposed with elements of China. By 1995 and increasingly afterwards, I think you have something new happening once a new icon is on the scene, the Pearl Orient Tower. Now, this represents a specific period in time. This represents the past along with this vision of the cosmopolitan past that's distinctively Chinese but cosmopolitan. And these represent the present or in this case the future. So this object which when it was built represented the height of modernity as well as the West is now shifted into representing increasingly a specific time period. And the kick about going to Shanghai now is as much the juxtaposition and jostling together of different eras, multiple different eras, as it is of multiple different cultures. And I'll just end with some images that I think um, highlight that. Here you see 
it's clearly now representing old rather than new. It's repre not re representing modern, it's representing what modern used to look like. In this case too, and this I would say is a sign of a return to segregated spaces segregated by a basis of wealth in China again. Um, this is, these are shots from the Biennale in uh, 2008, which I think bring together a sense of uh, Shanghai as a meeting place of um, different eras. Um, there's one section up there saying that it's about postmodern Shanghai, others about old Shanghai, and this is about the new Shanghainese. And so it's a place where um, eras are, are jumbled together. And the excitement, I mean, I think there is a danger and a loss of legibility, certainly, and I, I, I learned a lot from that first paper. But I think in some ways, part of the reason why people travel to Shanghai is because it challenges their notion of how things fit together. That is a disorienting experience. If it's too disorienting, it doesn't work. But part of the kick of it has always been the juxtaposition of um, different eras. And now, I think for the first time, the shift of, uh, these are images from different eras are often put together. This is the Urban Planning Museum upstairs that shows a futuristic vision of Shanghai. This is down in the basement where it shows um, the past in Shanghai. This is the basement of the Pearl Orient Tower, which has a history museum. There's a continual foregrounding of, uh, just as there was in the Treaty Port period, this is a place where different parts of the world come together. There's an insistence in Shanghai that this is a place where different periods come together. This is a Shanghai bookstore that has go one way to read about old Shanghai, the other about new Shanghai. This is a first ever in the world futuristic thing in Shanghai, for better or worse, the Barbie store. It's claim again to be, it's the first Barbie superstore in the world. And finally, and I will end, the, the buildings, even though they're thought of as rooted in one place, have always, in a sense, been in, move, in motion. This is a Hong Kong restaurant called um, the, uh, the Lao Fan Dian. It's a replica, in a sense, of a Shanghai restaurant, which includes a replica of the Bund. So these are in movement. Um, the images of Shanghai have always been in movement, literally, by showing up in varieties of um, Hollywood film. There have always been Hollywood film sets replicating um, Shanghai of different ports. This is one of the least known ones, Stowaway, starring Shirley Temple, who goes along the Bund and helps Robert Young buy a dragon's head. Um, but now, while Shanghai's icons are still traveling into film and onto celluloid, now sometimes things like the Peace Hotel are still traveling into, say, Merchant Ivory films, the old, one, uh, old buildings that you can still film outside. Now it's new icons, such as the Pudong images, are traveling into the future, literally, in a science fiction film, Code 46, which was filmed by a director who didn't want to build special sets to represent the future, because he thought the future would look more like the present than when you build a special set. So he looked around the world for places that audience would be fooled into thinking couldn't possibly exist today. He shot in Shanghai and Dubai. And Shanghai's objects are traveling within Shanghai. If you see, this is a streetcar from the 20s, but this is a car from a more recent time. This is not Shanghai itself. This is Chedun Film Studios just outside of Shanghai. We're in another kind of East meets East as well as East meets West. Not only Hollywood films like Painted Veil are, viewed there, are filmed there, but Lust Caution by the originally Taiwanese director Ang Lee was filmed there. This is from Kung Fu Hustle. Another East meets East in Shanghai is Hong Kong uh, things. And this is Wing Victory. The only place you can see Wing Victory is not at the Bund, but out at Chedun where they didn't bother building the buildings of the Bund because you can still shoot them on the Bund, but they had to shoot, put that in. But they put it right next to a cathedral um, from Xu Jiahui, so you actually get Shanghai in, um, it's much more convenient. You can walk from one part of Shanghai to another, still there. Um, the only thing I'll say about Haibao, the expo, is it's no accident that he's blue, going back to the first paper. It's a nod to Shanghai's connection to the sea. For all the other things to mock about Haibao, the fact that he's high and blue probably makes some sense. And I'll end just by plugging my next book, which if you enjoyed this talk, I'll be back in April once it's out to give a book talk at the Center uh, for Chinese Studies. Thanks for your attention.